thank you all for standing by and, and welcome to today's webinar on Active Directory and Entropy Augmentation with Vault 1.3 as well as KMIP. Um, today we'll be demoing the latest features available in Vault 1.3 and KMIP. Um, so my name is Caroline Guo and I'll be helping facilitate today's webinar. During the webinar, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box. This webinar is going to be recorded and the recording will be made available within a couple business days. So expect to hear from us probably the first week of December. Um, our speakers today are Becca Petrin, Alex Weibo, and Nick Kabatoff, and they are all software engineers working on HashiCorp Bolt. They'll be telling us a little bit more about the different features and conducting demos for you all today. And with that, I'd like to pass it off to Becca to kick us off. Great, thanks. Um, yeah. So we do have some really exciting features that came out in Vault 1.3, and we're not gonna try to cover all of them here, um, but we are gonna take you through a couple of them. And um, at the end, we have some links available for you um, to the 1.3 announcement blog post where you can go and get more documentation about any of these features that you would like, um, including the ones that we do and don't cover here um, in depth. Um, but yeah, the agenda for today is gonna be that first we go through Active Directory, then we're gonna also talk about entropy augmentation, that'll be Alex, and then KMIP is what Nick is going to cover. And um, just to kind of recap a little bit, um, in addition to the ones that we're gonna cover here, um, Active Directory, where you can check out um, service accounts and their passwords, entropy augmentation, um, we're gonna cover those, but those aren't all of the features. Um, there's also the Kubernetes sidecar, feature that came out in 1.3, where you can inject application pods with vault tokens through mutating webhook service. And there's a new vault debug um, command where you can gather health metrics um, and you know stuff that's intended to help you troubleshoot if you're ever in a production situation or whatever, um, where you just want to gather more information and then be able to react to it quickly. Um, so um, for the Kubernetes and the vault debug stuff, definitely follow that link to the blog post. Um, for other stuff, we'll just dig right into it right now. So first, um, I'm going to cover Active Directory. Um, my name is Becca Petrin, and I'm a software engineer, a back-end software engineer here at HashiCorp. I'm on the Vault ecosystem team. My pronouns she, her, and if you ever travel the GitHub universe, you might know me as Tyrannosaurus Bex. Um, and so what I worked on and added to this feature was the Active Directory secret checkout feature. So we had um, both customers in the community asking us, um, you know, we would really like it if people could check out service accounts and their passwords from Active Directory. Um, the reason for that is that um, I think that a lot of people actually end up sharing um, service accounts because their licensing plan can be such that they get charged by having more. And so they want to kind of, they're saying, I don't really need this many, you know, really, we're just only going to use this from this time to another time. And, a lot of services or people can share a particular one. And so we put in some extra effort and added that to Vault Now. So basically, um, the way that it works is that you can check out service accounts. Um, so you set up a group of service accounts that are available for a team, let's say, or an application to check out. Um, you could have like an accounting team and you could put two service accounts into it. And if you try to check out a service account, um, if one is available, you'll get the service account and the password, and you'll be the only person or application instance that knows the password. And then when you're done, you can check it back in. And Vault always rotates passwords when the service accounts are being checked in. Um, and also, if you run out of time on your checkout, and you can set the time, um, your administrator can, and you can say you need it for less if, if necessary. But when Vault checks it back in at the end of a time running out, then it also rotates the password. And then um, this happens automatically. Um, you don't have to do anything. So either the person can actively check it in because they're done and want to make it available to other people, or Vault will see that the time ran out and it'll just automatically check it in right when the time runs out. And why would this be useful? Um, it allows you to service, share service accounts securely. Um, so, you know, only one person can possibly be using it at a time or application. Um, and because it's one user at a time, then you can tie back um, actions that were taken with this, this service account at a particular time. So you can say, oh, this service account at whatever time had this thing happen. Now, who had it checked out from Vault? Okay, now I know who had it checked out. It's in the audit logs of Vault. And this can allow you to give attribution to these um, 
to these different actions taken in service uh, or in Active Directory. And it's fully automatable. So while this can be used for a person or a group of people, it also has like a full API. And when you've got like a pool of service accounts, like let's say it's a pool of service accounts for your web workers, if your web workers are getting to be an expanding service and you find that you don't have enough service accounts for all these web workers in here, you can just add some more. And then um, that way you can be, you know, sharing service accounts across an entire service, but still nobody's ever using the same service account at once. It's audible, who's doing what, and um, it can kind of grow with your service. Um, so let me go ahead and show you what this really looks like, um, just so you can get kind of a feeling for it. I'm gonna share my terminal. So right here on the right-hand side, I've got Vault running. It's just a dev instance of Vault, nothing particularly exciting happening there. And on the left side, I'm gonna just kind of take you for a little tour. Um, so the first way is you do Vault Secrets Enable AD, short for Active Directory. And that's just turning on that Secrets engine in Vault. The next thing you need to do is you need to tell it how to speak to your Active Directory server we use a, an LDAP connection to do that. That's what we're doing here. We're just saying, you know, here's where our Active Directory server is running. And here's a, a highly privileged user you can use for managing all the rest of the ones. And, um, you know, we wouldn't normally have this insecure, but just for the demo, we're, we're not going to worry about certificates and stuff too much. Um, but I really have an Active Directory server running um, right now. And so this is a live demo. It's all real stuff here. Um, so now that I have told Vault how to talk to my Active Directory server, I also need to tell it um, which service accounts. Let's establish a pool of service accounts that are available for checkout. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding a new set of service accounts to the library. I'm naming this set the accounting team's set of service accounts. The service accounts that will be in it that they can check out are fizz at example.com and buzz at example.com. Um, whenever they check something out, the time to live before Vault checks it back in is only gonna be 15 seconds. So you probably wouldn't do that in real life, but I'm just doing that in this demo, um, setting it to be really short so that we can watch Vault check something back in and see what that feels like. So now that we've kind of configured this, oh, and this is if they wanted to renew their checkout, they could and Vault would not rotate um, the service account password um, for another 15 seconds. Um, anyhow, so let's go ahead and see what it looks like if we read. Let, like, let's say we're an administrator and we want to see what service accounts are in here exactly. We can read that and it just tells us our configuration at this endpoint. That's not super exciting. Um, let's look at something a little more exciting. Let's see um, what the status of these service accounts is. Are they checked in or are they checked out? Okay, it looks like they're both available right now. Now, let's go ahead and actually check one of these out and see what happens. Um, so I'm gonna use the write um, command. The reason that it's a write command is because if you want to check it out for less time than the default, in this case, it's 15 seconds, so you would never wanna do that. But let's say your default checkout time was like a week long, but you know that if you have it more than a day, then you just forgot to check it back in. Um, you can designate that you only need it for 24 hours. And if Vault hasn't heard from you, it can just check it back in. So anyways, um, we're not gonna add the TTL here in order to do that, but it's, it's out there. So anyways, what I've just done here is I checked out fizz at example.com and Vault went ahead and not only gave me the service account, but this is the password that it had already for fizz at example.com. My checkout only lasted 15 seconds and I managed to talk for that long. And so Vault already has checked it back in. Um, so now if I check it out again, watch this. It's now got a new password, right? So here it was KO slash K, it was ending in that, but now we can see it's definitely a new password. And the reason that happened is because when Vault checked it in right here, it rotated the password at that time, so I would not know it anymore. So you can kind of see that happening there. And also, let's just take a quick look at what the status looks like when something is checked out. We can actually see that not only is it checked out, but the person who borrowed it, this is a salted hash of their client token. 
And so you wouldn't be able to derive their actual token from it because that would be a security issue. But you would be able to figure out that somebody else's token um, is the same as this when it's salted and hashed in the same way. And so that way you can tie it back. And there are also audit logs happening with all of this about um, who's checking out these service accounts. Another interesting measure for it is that by default, you can only check in service accounts that are checked out to you. Um, so let's say you were like, oh, I'm also on the accounting team. There aren't enough service accounts available. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check in somebody else's so that I can just check it out again. You can't do that by default. Um, if you want to disable that, you can, but by default, you can only check in stuff that you checked out. Also, there is a management override. There are two ways to management override a checkout. So if somebody has it for too long and you wanna forcibly check it back in, a highly privileged person at your organization can do that. And I think that's mainly it for this feature, but um, yeah, it's pretty cool because um, the, the feature of having Vault automatically check it back in and rotate the password right then is definitely new for the Active Directory Secrets Engine. And so if you had been wanting to approach service account sharing and you were waiting for Vault to be able to check things in and rotate the passwords, um, it's now here. So hopefully that will be helpful to um, some folks. And with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Alex, who's gonna go into entropy authentication. All right, I think you can hear me now. Great. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Alex. Um, for uh, the 1.3 release, I've been working on entropy augmentation, and I'll talk a little bit about that now. Oops. Um, so I'm a software engineer at HashiCorp. You can find me on GitHub at Lexman42 or on LinkedIn at Lexman. So to start out, what is entropy? Computers are predictable machines, but sometimes we need them to do things that are not easy to predict. And this is especially true in cryptography. So for a formal definition of entropy, we can think of this as randomness collected by an operating system or some other application that we wanna use in cryptography, but there are also other uses. Um, conventionally, we'll take this to get some random uh, piece of data. We'll try to talk to our environment. So this can be from the user's keystrokes or mouse movements, or um, another one is to go off the system clock. So currently, where does Vault get its entropy? This task is delegated to the operating system that Vault is running on. So this means that depending on where you're running Vault, the actual mechanisms involved in sourcing and mixing and delivering entropy are different. Where does Vault get entropy with entropy augmentation? What this feature allows you to do is configure a network device, so for example, an HSN, and give Vault the option to decide whether it's going to get the entropy from this network device or if it's going to get entropy as it has been uh, in the past from the operating system. The way we do this is um, through a seal stanza, which can be configured the same way it always has been. And in the 1.3 release, we're only supporting the PKCS11 seal. Now, I'd like to mention that external entropy is not used for every single operation. The reason is that Vault uh, uses quite a lot of entropy. Um, instead, it's just used for these critical security parameters uh, that are listed here. So this is an example of configuration to use the feature. Um, you would configure a PKCS11 seal and then followed by this entropy stanza. And why would you want to use this feature? Well, probably at some point yourself or um, your organization is going to reach a level where um, you're required to have entropy in some kind of way that isn't um, possible solely through a software mechanism. So when you start needing external devices, um, that's when you would start leveraging Vault's ability to now uh, get entropy from an externally configured device. So for the demo, what I'm going to do is just run through some um, basic Vault commands and we'll see through some logs when it's talking through the PKCS11 API to an HSM um, to get entropy and when it's going through the Go API 
to source entropy from the operating system. So to do that, on the right, first I'm going to uh, bring up Vault and log into this container. And so uh, these are the logs I'm going to look at. So we can see that there have already been some calls to the HSM. These are the bytes that were returned um, from the HSM. And the reason for this is that when Vault started up, it created an encryption key and then it encrypted that key with a master key. We can also see that um, there were calls via the OSS, the operating system. And the reason for that is because there were a bunch of other things that happened as well, including accessors and IDs which need to be random, but they don't necessarily, they're not critical in the sense that they need to come from this um, externally configured device. So a clear one is rekeying. Obviously this is a sensitive um, operation. So if I go through rekeying, And I need to go grab my recovery key. And we can see that this operation sourced entropy externally. Um, something that's cool is that this external entropy is um, available to internal plugins. Um, so I'll go through how we can use this external entropy in the transit engine. Um, so the first thing I want to do is enable transit and instead of enabling just a regular transit, I'm going to enable a secure transit. The way that I specify that we want to give the plugin access to the external entropy is with this new flag, uh, external entropy access. So by default, the plugin will not have access to the external entropy source. Uh, yeah, this is going to be transit. So now if I list all the secret engines that I have, oops. I can see that under secure uh, transit, there's this uh, true flag um, saying that it does have access to external entropy. Uh, so if I were to write a key then, say write, Uh, let's just close demo one. So let's just create a regular transit. And here we can see that this transit does not have access to the external entropy source. And if we were to do the same things, uh, write a key. So we're expecting um, nothing to come from the HSM, which is what happened. And the same thing for a rotate. So that was a very quick overview, um, but I think that underlines the basics. And there are uh, there is material on learn.hashcorp.com um, that goes into a little bit more detail um, for a demo similar to this one. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Nick. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Let me just get my share going. Um, All right, so I'm going to talk to you about the Vault KMIP Secrets Engine today. Uh, my name is Nick Kabatoff. I'm an, also a developer on the Vault team. My GitHub is nkabatoff and so on. So what's KMIP? KMIP is an OASIS standard. It's similar to PKCS11, which is from the same folks, um, but where PKCS11 is a standard for uh, working with cryptographic objects using a C library, 
here it's kind of the same idea but over TCP IP and somewhat modernized. Another way you could think about it is that it's uh, similar to working with a Vault API, but using a completely different binary protocol running over TCP IP instead of uh, our text-based protocol running over HTTP. But ultimately it's a way for clients to talk to servers and ask them to do things to keys, which is usually what the, manic with what the cryptographic objects are. So it defines operations like creating keys, registering keys, finding keys, revoking keys, and so forth. And all those things that these operations work on are called managed objects. This is a, an enterprise feature, the KMIP Secrets Engine, that was actually introduced in 1.2. We added a couple new operations supported in 1.3, but since we didn't talk about it that much back around 1.2, we're talking about it now. So why would you want to use KMIP? Well, there's a whole bunch of software out there that doesn't know how to talk to Vault and may never learn how to talk to Vault, but that does support KMIP. So if you want your MongoDB enterprise or your MySQL enterprise servers to do encryption at rest, you could either do that and then have to manage the keys yourself, or you could do it with KMIP and then Vault can take care of centralized key management. It also works with vSphere and various others. There is a tutorial on setting up MongoDB with Vault KMIP on the Learn site, but today I'm going to show you how to do it with MySQL Enterprise. Before we can get to the demo though, there's a few concepts I need to explain first. These are not uh, Vault concepts or KMIP concepts. They're specific to the KMIP Secrets Engine in Vault. The first concept is a scope, and these are used to partition the storage space. So it's kind of like a vault namespace, but they're not optional, they're not nestable, there's no root scope. So it's just a way of dividing up all of the managed objects into a single level of directories, you could say. You can create roles within a scope, and a role defines a constrained set of KMIP operations. So you could say all, you could say none, you could say anything in between, like just get and locate. And then a credential is something you create within a role that allows you to generate a TLS client certificate. And the role and the scope are embedded within the certificate as attributes. This way, when you do the TLS handshake, you are going to be telling Vault what the role and scope that you have are, and Vault can thereby limit what operations you can do based on the role that's in the certificate, and it will be able to figure out which managed objects you should be able to see or where managed objects you create go based on the scope. This little diagram is just to show uh, some differences in how the requests are processed. So when you issue uh, commands through the Vault CLI or using the HTTP API directly to manipulate scopes and roles and credentials and configuration of the KMIP secrets function, you're going to be connecting to the regular Vault listener. Uh, the regular Vault ACLs will come into play in the Vault policy engine. And the things that you created as a result, like scopes and roles, you can actually interact with subsequently, like you can do a list to see which scopes exist. The requests that are issued uh, using the KMIT protocol itself are going to be handled on a different listener and port, and they're not going to be processed using Vault ACLs because they don't look like Vault requests. They're a completely different format. But the role in question will impact what operations you can perform in a similar way. And the result is going to be managed objects, which again, you can't interact with through any means except KMIP requests. So any keys that you create using KMIP, you won't be able to see using the regular Vault API yet. Okay, so let's start the demo. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to enable KMIP as a secret sanction. I'll configure the listener that it defines. I'll create a scope and then a role within that scope, and then a credential within that role. 
and using that, I'll be able to tell MongoDB to come up using that um, client certificate and register its keys in Vault. So let me change which window I'm sharing. So hopefully you can see my terminal now. So I've just got an empty vault here and I've got a little temporary directory and it's got a data directory in there that I'm gonna use for Mongo, but there's nothing there yet. So first thing is we need to enable KMIP. And now if we look at the list of secret engines, we've got KMIP enabled. Now I need a listener. So I'm going to write this configuration, which is going to make a listener listen on port 5696. It's also going to create a CA and a server certificate. Now we need a scope. So let's create a scope called scope one. And now we need a role within that scope. So we'll create a role one within scope one and say no restrictions, all operations are permitted. And finally, we need a TLS client certificate. So here, this is a bit of a longer command, but I'm just doing a write to the generate endpoint for scope one and role one. I'm outputting it as a PEM bundle, and then I'm extracting the client certificate from there and saving it in this file, client PEM. I also need the CA, um, which you can get, I think, from the as part of the output of the previous command, but it's a little bit simpler to do it this way. So now we have a client PEM and a CA PEM. So we're ready to go now. We can just go ahead and start Mongo. This is just the regular MongoDB enterprise that you can download from the, their website. Note that I'm pointing it to the KMIP server localhost on port 5696 like we used earlier and using those two PEM files that we just generated. And I'm gonna save the output in a log file just because it's pretty verbose. So let's see what that looks like. I'm not gonna show you the whole log, but if we look for KMIP in there, we can see that it created a KMIP key with this ID that starts with 1DH, and then it initialized the encryption key manager, and it seemed happy. If we run it again, this time we don't see that it created the KMIP key, but it again was able to initialize it. We can actually see in the um, in the vault audit log that these requests, even though they have a very different format, are audited as well. So here is the response from our last request, and we can see that in the response payload, there's the same key that we saw printed in the MongoDB output, which is a, a tag describing this managed object. And then here is the symmetric key that we sent back to it when it asked us, give me the key corresponding to this attribute. Obviously it's HMACT, so we can't see the actual data, but that's a good thing. And one last thing, let's just go and stop vault and run Mongo again, just so that you can see that this time it should fail. Yeah. So that is the end of the demo. Um, let me quickly go back to the slides. So just to wrap things up, uh, there's more information about these new features and other new 1.3 features in this blog post. And you can get more information about that or about getting Vault Enterprise at the above links. And that is everything. So I guess we'll be taking questions now. Great. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Becca and Alex. Um, we uh, actually have only received one question in the Q&A box so far, so we can answer that question live. 
Uh, and the question is for you, Nick. Uh, does KMIP also support Oracle SGBD? I don't know. Um, we haven't tried it. It's very possible it does. Uh, there, we don't support all operations in the KMIP protocol yet. So if it doesn't, then let us know and we'll look into it and see what's, what needs to be implemented. Okay, great. Uh, we have one other question um, around KMIP. Is an HSM supported via KMIP? It depends. If the HSM speaks KMIP, then probably, but we haven't tried any. Um, most HSMs, to my knowledge, do not. They speak PKCS 11, even if behind the scenes there is a network protocol going on as well. Okay, great. And then question on Active Directory, is the AD check-in slash checkout also available in the UI? Not yet, um, but it will be. Okay, great. That was all of the oh, follow-on questions. Sorry, follow-on questions that we just got. Is the check-in slash checkout limited to only service accounts? Um, yeah, um, I'm not sure what other type of object um, people would want to check out. But if there's something that you're looking for, do feel free to um, let us know somehow and uh, and we can uh, take a look at it. Okay, and then this is a question for Alex. Uh, for Entropy, can Entropy implementation work with uh, PKI secrets as well? Um, so right now for the Entropy augmentation, it has to be configured through one of the um, well, in the future, it'll have to be configured through one of the uh, seals. Um, and so right now, the only one available is PKCS 11. Uh, like Nick was saying, if your HSM does speak uh, PKCS 11, um, then you could configure it as a seal. So if you're able to use it as um, an unsealing device, as an auto seal device, then you would be able to use it for entropy augmentation. Okay, great. And that covers all of the questions that we received in the question box. Uh, all right. So thank you to the speakers and thanks to the audience members for joining. I hope everyone enjoyed today's webinar and have a better understanding of the latest features in 103 in KMIP. If you don't already have Vault Enterprise or are interested in any of the enterprise features that were available in 1.3, you can reach out to a sales representative um, at hashicorp.com slash go slash contact sales. It'll be a, a form there. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this was recorded and we'll make the recording available after a few business days for post-processing. Uh, and I will send an email out to everyone who registered um, with the final recording. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you for joining.